So the next speaker of uh, this morning's session is uh, Nina Holden from ETH, ETH uh, Zurich, and uh, she's going to speak about integrability of schramm leuven evolutions via conformal welding of random surfaces. So we're looking forward to your talk, Nina. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, also, thanks for uh, arranging this uh, nice conference and for inviting me to give a talk. And uh, so I will be talking uh, about a collaboration with uh, Maurice Ang and uh, Shin Sun. Uh, Maurice Ang is a PhD student uh, at MIT, uh, while uh, Shin Sun is a professor at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I will start the talk by giving a brief introduction to, to SLE. Uh, so to introduce uh, SLE, we let a kappa be a parameter greater than or equal uh, to zero. Uh, we let D be a simply connected subset uh, or domain of, of the complex plane, uh, and we also let A and B be distinct boundary points of, of D. Uh, a schramm leuven evolution with a parameter kappa on D, comma, A, comma, B. Uh, it is a particular random fractal curve uh, in the domain D connecting the two points uh, A and B. Uh, the parameter kappa is determining how windy or fractal the curve is. Uh, so when kappa is equal to zero, uh, the SLE is a deterministic uh, curve. Uh, well, when we increase the value of kappa, uh, the curve is getting more and more uh, windy. Uh, SLE curves uh, describe uh, the scaling limit of, of curves arising in statistical physics models. Uh, for example, um, for example, um, uh, the models known as the Luperes uh, random walk, uh, the Ising model, the FK Ising model, uh, percolation, and uh, the uniform spanning tree. Uh, SLE was introduced by uh, Audus Ram uh, in 1999. Uh, so Audus Ram, he realized that uh, several uh, of the models, the uh, discrete models described on the previous slide, uh, they were believed to have scaling limits uh, having two properties in, in common. Uh, and these two properties are known as conformal invariance uh, and the domain Markov property. Uh, and he proved that there is a unique uh, one parameter family of, of curves, uh, which is satisfying these two properties. Uh, and he called these curves uh, SLE. Uh, conformal invariance is illustrated uh, in the figure. Uh, so uh, in the left part of the figure, we have uh, an SLE eta uh, in the domain D. Uh, phi is a conformal map uh, sending the domain uh, D uh, to another domain uh, D tilde. Uh, and conformal invariance, it means that the image of, of eta under the conformal map phi uh, has the law of uh, an SLE uh, in the domain uh, D tilde. Uh, so since uh, this conference uh, is about SPDs, I was also want to give uh, the Leuven train definition of, of SLE. Uh, so this definition of SLE will actually not be playing uh, an important role uh, in the rest of the talk, uh, but I think it, it is of interest for people who, who work on, on SPDs. Uh, so, uh, in order to give this definition, uh, we assume now that eta is some uh, arbitrary simple curve uh, in the upper half plane uh, from zero to uh, infinity. As uh, so we can uh, consider this curve uh, run until time t, uh, so if we consider the upper half plane uh, and we remove uh, the init uh, this initial uh, segment uh, of the curve, uh, then we get the slit domain. Uh, and it's possible to show that uh, there is a unique uh, conformal map uh, from the slit domain uh, and to the upper half plane, uh, which is fixing uh, infinity uh, and, uh, and which uh, looks like z plus a little o1 uh, nearby uh, infinity. Uh, so uh, it's, pos it's possible to show that uh, g sub t uh, is satisfying uh, the differential equation, which is known as the Leuvner uh, differential equation, and which is shown uh, in the indented equation. Uh, in the denominator on uh, the right side, uh, you can see that there is uh, a function uh, w, uh, and uh, w sub t, uh, it is defined to be the image uh, of the tip uh, of, of the curve uh, under uh, this conformal map, uh, g sub t. Um, so if, if we assume now that uh, eta is uh, a random curve, uh, and we assume that uh, it is conformally invariant and satisfies this domain marker property, uh, then one can deduce from this that this function uh, w, it must have IID increments and it must satisfy Brownian scaling. Uh, so this implies further that uh, w has to be a constant multiple of a standard uh, Brownian motion. Uh, conversely, uh, if we uh, start with a Brownian motion, uh, then we can solve the Leuven differential equation to get the family of conformal maps, uh, g sub t, uh, and this further uh, allows us uh, to, uh, to obtain this curve, uh, eta. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so therefore, um, uh, this Leuven differential equation, it allows us uh, to construct uh, SLE uh, by using uh, Brownian motion. Uh, and this the construction has, has turned out to be very, uh, very useful um, because it allows to um, to um, express uh, uh, proper or uh, properties of SLE uh, in terms of the properties of uh, Brownian motion. 
Uh, okay, so uh, next I want to introduce uh, SLE with force points. Uh, as SLE with force points, uh, it is in some ways uh, the most natural uh, generalization of, of SLE. Uh, and in this talk, we will be considering uh, the case of SLE with, with two force points. Uh, in order to define this, uh, we let uh, kappa, d, uh, and a and b uh, be as before, uh, but now we have two additional points, z minus and z plus uh, on the domain boundary, and we also have two parameters, uh, rho uh, plus minus. Uh, so SLE kappa rho, uh, it is the natural variant uh, of SLE where we keep track of uh, the location of, uh, of two force points uh, on the domain boundary. Uh, so this SLE kappa rho, it's still satisfying some variant of uh, conformal invariance and the domain marker property, but some, but some variant uh, of this property where we also keep track of, uh, of the location of these two mark points. Uh, in the remainder of the talk, we will assume that these two mark points, uh, they lie uh, infinitesimally to the left uh, and right uh, of the starting point uh, of the, the curve. And as you can ask, what kind of effect uh, these two force points have on the curve? Uh, and, uh, and the answer is that uh, the force point, uh, it will be attractive uh, if the value or if, if this parameter rho is negative, uh, and it will be repulsive if rho is, is positive. Uh, so this is illustrated uh, on the figure. Uh, so in the left figure, we have rho minus equal to zero, uh, and we have rho plus positive. Uh, so this means that uh, the curve will be uh, pushed away from uh, the right boundary arc. Uh, in, in the second figure, then we have rho, rho minus and rho plus both equal to zero, uh, and then we get, just get uh, a regular SLE. Uh, in the third figure, we have uh, rho plus negative, uh, which means that the curve uh, is attracted uh, towards the right uh, boundary arc of the domain. Uh, whereas in the fourth figure, we have uh, rho plus less than cap over two minus two, uh, and then this attractive force is so strong uh, that uh, the curve is, is hitting uh, the right uh, boundary arc. Uh, so SLE, it was introduced, SLE uh, with force points, it was introduced by uh, Lolas Raman Werner in 2002. Uh, so this was only three years after uh, SLE itself was, was introduced. Uh, then um, Julian Dubeda, uh, or so is Lolas Raman Werner, they considered the case of SLE with, with one point, uh, one force point, and then uh, Julian Dubeda, he was generalizing this definition uh, to, uh, to multiple force points uh, in 2003. Uh, and then, um, uh, in, uh, and then later, uh, Miller, from, uh, no, Miller, uh, Miller and uh, Sheffield, uh, they proved uh, that um, uh, that the SLE uh, kappa rho is well defined as a continuous curve, uh, and they also give give uh, conditions on uh, on these parameters uh, rho uh, in order for the curve uh, to be well defined. Uh, so the SLE kappa rho, it is rising uh, in a large number of, of settings. Uh, for example, one way to get an SLE kappa rho is to start out with a regular SLE and then condition this uh, SLE on, on, certain, on, on certain natural uh, events. Uh, so uh, the setting which is most relevant for the purpose of this talk uh, is in the setting of uh, Leeuwen quantum gravity, uh, where SLE kappa uh, rho is arising um, when one does uh, what we call conformal welding of uh, Leeuwen quantum gravity surfaces. Uh, so we'll be coming back to this uh, later in the talk. Uh, so this SLE with force points, it can also be defined by uh, uh, Leuven chains. Uh, so again, we can get an SLE force point by solving uh, this Leuvener uh, differential equation. Uh, as you may remember from the definition of SLE, that then we had then this uh, what we call the driving function uh, W. Uh, it was a constant multiple of uh, a standard Brownian motion. Uh, in order to get uh, SLE uh, with force points, uh, then we need to add some uh, need to add uh, add some drift terms. Uh, so you can see that we have some um, a drift term uh, varying in time uh, and which depends on uh, on the location of uh, of these mark points. Uh, so this is uh, the main result that I want to present uh, in this talk. Uh, so. Um, uh, so uh, on the figure, you can see uh, SLE uh, kappa rho uh, in the unit disk, which is connecting the points uh, plus minus i. Uh, so uh, with probability one, uh, there will be a unique complementary uh, connected component uh, of the curve, uh, which has the point one on its boundary. Uh, so this complementary um, connected component of the curve, uh, it is uh, shown in, in light blue uh, in, uh, in the figure. Uh, so on the boundary of this light blue domain, uh, there will be exactly two points, uh, which lie both on, uh, on the SLE curve uh, and on the boundary uh, of, uh, of the domain. Uh, and these two points uh, are shown in green. Uh, it will let Psi uh, be a conformal map, uh, which is sending uh, the blue uh, domain uh, to the unit disk, uh, and which is sending these two green points uh, to plus minus i, uh, and which is fixing the location of, uh, of one. 
Uh, so in, uh, in our theorem, uh, we are proving uh, an explicit formula for uh, the moments of the derivative of uh, this conformal map uh, at, uh, at one. Uh, so you can see that in our uh, formula, you can see that there is a function f, uh, there is also a function alpha, and there is a parameter uh, lambda zero. Uh, and the definition of, of this object is shown under the statement of the theorem. Uh, so, uh, so to define uh, these uh, these objects, then we first set q uh, to be equal to two over kappa plus kappa two over root kappa plus uh, root kappa over two. Uh, then we define uh, the function, which is known as uh, the double uh, gamma function. Uh, so this is defined in uh, the second line. Uh, so this uh, double gamma function it is uh, defined by the shown uh, integral uh, when the real part of kappa and the, the real uh, part of, of z is um, uh, is positive. And it is defined by analytic continuation when the real part of Z is, is negative. Uh, so then in the third line, you can see that this function F uh, appearing in the theorem statement, it is defined uh, as the ratio of these uh, double gamma functions. Uh, then uh, in the fourth line, uh, I have defined the function uh, alpha uh, implicitly. Uh, and then in the last line, uh, I have defined this parameter uh, lambda zero. Uh, so if uh, lambda, uh, the lambda in the theorem is greater uh, than or equal to lambda zero, then uh, the considered uh, expectation is, uh, is infinite. Uh, so the explicit uh, formulas that, that you can see here uh, are not so uh, important. Um, so, so the main takeaway is just that uh, we are able to write down uh, an explicit uh, formula for uh, the moments. And it's also interesting to observe that this double gamma function uh, is appearing in, uh, in the formula. Uh, so this double, double gamma function is uh, probably most uh, well known because it appears in several contexts uh, in uh, conformal field theory. Uh, so one of the most uh, interesting aspects uh, of this proof uh, is that it's using uh, certain couplings between uh, SLE uh, and what we call uh, Lie-Wolf quantum gravity surfaces. Uh, and the proof is also using uh, exact formulas from uh, Lie-Wolf conformal field theory. Um, a second remark is that uh, the theorem is difficult to approach by a classical uh, Loebner chain uh, method. Uh, so uh, if we use the definition of, uh, of SLE uh, in terms of uh, the Loebner differential equation, uh, then it's possible via a martingale argument uh, to express uh, the left-hand side uh, of this uh, formula uh, in terms of uh, the solution of a particular PDE uh, in uh, three variables. Uh, we get uh, three variables, uh, roughly speaking, because uh, if we uh, map out the curve at time t, so just shown in uh, the figure, then in addition to this point um, uh, w sub t, uh, there are three special points uh, on the real line. Uh, so two of the special points will be uh, v minus sub t and v plus uh, sub t. And the third special point will be the image of, uh, of the point uh, one, uh, and, uh, and this is also a special point because this is uh, the point at which we uh, are interested in, uh, in evaluating, uh, evaluating uh, the derivative. Uh, so here I also assume that we have applied uh, a conformal map uh, between uh, the unit disk and the upper half plane, uh, which sends, uh, fixes the location of one and which sends uh, plus minus i to uh, zero and, uh, and infinity. Uh, so it is possible to also approach um, approach uh, the, uh, the problem that we consider by a, uh, by a, a classical uh, Loebner chain techniques. Uh, but this PD uh, that we get by this approach, uh, it, uh, it seems to be very hard uh, to solve. And so it's interesting to observe uh, that we are able to, to prove the theorem uh, by using uh, this coupling between SOE and, uh, and LQG. Uh, so a uh, final remark uh, is that um, uh, the formula uh, we prove, it takes the same form uh, for all values of, of kappa. Uh, so this is interesting because the proof is actually completely different uh, when kappa is between 0 and 4 and when uh, kappa is, uh, is greater uh, than, uh, is greater than um, 4. Uh, so um, uh, so uh, roughly, uh, so I, I can mention that when kappa is greater than four, then uh, the idea of the proof is to use something called SLE duality uh, between uh, the values uh, kappa and 16 over kappa. Uh, and in the rest of, of uh, the proof, I will only be focusing uh, on the case when uh, kappa is uh, between uh, zero and uh, four. Uh, okay, so there was a question in the chat here, which is what is the intuition for the value of, of lambda zero? So this specific value. Um, so one can actually, um, 
so one can actually see uh, get the threshold also by simpler techniques uh, than what we are considering. Uh, so, um, uh, so roughly speaking, um, if you if you only want to understand when when one has finiteness, uh, then one can observe that uh, when uh, the SLV curve, uh, if the curve is is getting uh, very close to the point one. Uh, then, uh, then this derivative will be very large. Uh, so, in order to um, to to see when the moment is finite, uh, then one can uh, one can get some estimates for the probability that an SLE is getting uh, is getting very close uh, to to a boundary point. Uh, so this uh, so so this probability it has some power law behavior. So, if you look at the probability that it gets within distance. Let's say the curve gets within distance, let's say s from uh, one, then uh, it has some power law behavior in, in s, uh, and uh, and by looking at that exponent, one can get um, uh, one can get uh, this um, this parameter uh, lambda zero. Uh, so this was actually um, uh, also uh, previously um, so this was known before our work. Um, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, um, I think it was actually considered in in several in several papers. Uh, I think we use a particular reference due to uh, Miller and ah uh, yeah, um, okay. So it has been computed in several works. I think we are using a particular reference of Miller and Wu in our paper, but I think it's it can also be derived from from some earlier works. Um, okay, so lambda zero, it does depend on kappa. So uh, it is given, uh, it is given by, by this formula. So it also depends on uh, rho plus. So it depends on this attractive force that uh, the curve has towards uh, the right boundary arc. Uh, and it also depends on, uh, on kappa. Yeah. Yeah so, uh, yeah, so I think actually this work of Miller and Wood was the first to prove to get this threshold for SLE kappa rho, but there have been earlier works which consider the case of uh, a regular kappa, or no, a regular SLE kappa uh, with a rho plus equal to zero. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so uh, in order to, um, uh, in order to carry out uh, the proof, uh, then I, uh, or then we, in order to explain how, uh, how we carry out the proof, then I first need, um, and I want to introduce the old quantum gravity. And in order to do that, I first need to introduce this uh, Gaussian free field. Uh, so the free boundary Gaussian free field uh, in the unit disk, it is the Gaussian uh, random field, which has uh, mean zero and which has covariance given by the Norman Green's function. Uh, so the Norman Green's function is given by uh, this formula. And you can see in particular that uh, it blows up uh, logarithmically when the two points uh, Z and W uh, approach uh, each other. As you can see from this definition that uh, the Gaussian free field, it cannot be uh, well defined as a function um, because um, uh, the Green's function is equal to infinity on, on the diagonal. Uh, uh, so, so therefore it cannot, uh, the GFF cannot be defined uh, at, any, at any fixed point. Uh, but it is possible uh, to show that uh, the Gaussian free field is well defined uh, at the random uh, distribution or a, a random uh, generalized function. Uh, so this means that if we have some smooth test function f, uh, then we can uh, integrate uh, f against uh, the Gaussian free field, uh, and this will give us some uh, real number. Uh, and this real number it will uh, be a normal normal distributed random variable with uh, mean zero, uh, and which has a variance uh, depending on uh, on this particular choice of, uh, of f. Uh, okay, so um, in order to define uh, what we mean by a Lewis quantum gravity surface, uh, then I let H be a Gaussian free field in the unit disk, uh, and I'll let gamma be a parameter uh, between zero and, and two. Uh, so uh, the Liu will error measure, uh, it is uh, heuristically speaking, uh, the error measure in the unit disk, which has uh, density e to the power gamma h uh, relative to uh, Lebesgue error measure in, uh, in the disk. Uh, the Liu will bander measure uh, is the measure which heuristically speaking has, has density e to the power gamma h over two uh, relative uh, to length measure along the boundary of uh, the unit disk. Uh, so these two uh, definitions um, of, uh, so of the label error measure and the label boundary measure, it doesn't make a uh, rigorous sense um, because uh, H is um, a distribution and not a function. So it's not obvious what e to the power of some constant uh, times H uh, means. Uh, 
And the label error measure and the label vendor measure, they can uh, be defined uh, rigorously by uh, regularizing the field. Uh, so the idea is to let uh, age the web Cylon uh, be some uh, regularized version of, of age. Uh, and then we can use age of web Cylon to define an error measure and a vendor measure. And we can show, show that these two measures uh, converge uh, when this uh, regularization parameter epsilon uh, is sent uh, to zero. Uh, so this uh, construction is, is, is classical and, uh, and it goes back to uh, Kahn and uh, her crew in, in the 70s and, uh, and 80s. Uh, so um, a gamma uh, LQG surface, uh, we define it uh, to be the pair uh, consisting of, uh, of the domain uh, D and, uh, and the field uh, H. Uh, and uh, and uh, the Lee will error measure mu and the Lee will bander measure nu, uh, they describe uh, the geometry of this uh, random uh, surface. As uh, so we want to view uh, an, an LQG surface as some kind of abstract um, surface or an abstract uh, Riemannian manifold, um, which can be embedded into the complex plane in, in various ways. Uh, and therefore, we say that um, two, uh, two surfaces are uh, equivalent uh, if they define uh, the same uh, area measure and the same boundary measure modulo the application of the control map. Uh, so for example, in the figure, you can see, um, you can see two different embeddings uh, of the same uh, gamma L3D surface, where we say that the surface uh, in the right part of the figure, uh, it is viewed as the same as the surface in the left part of the figure, because you can see that uh, the measures uh, are just uh, the measure obtained by uh, pushing forward uh, the measures there under this uh, conformal map. Uh, phi. Um, okay, so um, in this talk, we will be interested in uh, random uh, LQG surfaces, and um, uh, and in particular in uh, the, in the gamma LQG surface, which is known as as the gamma LQG disk. Uh, so to define this, we uh, again let gamma be between zero and two, uh, and we let uh, Q be equal to two over gamma uh, plus gamma over, over two. Uh, so then we let uh, H0 uh, be uh, the Neumann GFF uh, in the unit disk, uh, and we let C be a constant, which has been sampled from uh, this measure, uh, where uh, DC uh, is uh, Lebesgue measure on, on the full uh, real line. Uh, the gamma LQD disk, uh, it is uh, the LQD surface, which has field given by uh, H0 uh, plus uh, C. And as you can see that uh, this constant C is actually sampled from uh, an infinite measure. Uh, because DC was the bag measure on, on a full uh, real line. Uh, but still, we're using uh, vocabulary from probability theory. For example, we uh, refer to this as, as a random surface. We can talk about two surfaces being independent and, uh, and so on. Uh, so one reason that this gamma LQG disk is, is interesting is because it describes uh, the scaling limit of uh, discrete uh, surfaces, which are known as, uh, as planar maps. Uh, so I will not be giving any precise definitions related to planar maps uh, in the talk, um, but roughly speaking, uh, a planar map, um, uh, it is uh, a graph, uh, a planar uh, graph, um, uh, such, as, uh, such as the one that you can see in, in the figure. Uh, in the left part of the figure, I, I suppose that I've sampled uh, the planar map at random, such that all planar maps uh, of the same size uh, have the same probability of being sampled. Uh, and, um, and, and I call this, uh, this map a uniformly sampled. Uh, in the right part of the figure, on the other hand, then I have sampled the planar map, uh, such that the probability of sampling a particular map is proportional uh, to the easing model partition function uh, on the planar map. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, so both of these, uh, both of these planar maps, they are believed to converge to the LPG disk uh, in, in the scaling limit uh, with for two different values of, of gamma. In the case of the uniform sample disk, then this convergence result has been proved, while it's only uh, conjectural in, in the case of uh, of, um, uh, of the planar map uh, decorated with uh, the e -sig model. Uh, we can also consider uh, the gamma LPG disk uh, with two mark points. Um, so in order to define this, uh, then uh, we'll let beta be a parameter uh, less than uh, the parameter Q. Uh, and then when we define the field uh, of the disk, uh, then we add two logarithmic singularities uh, to the field. Uh, so at the points plus minus i, then we place a logarithmic uh, singularity of, of magnitude uh, beta. Uh, so this gamma LQD disk uh, with two mark points, it's also of interesting. It's also of interest because it uh, arises as, as the scaling limit of, of planar maps. Uh, so one example is, is shown in the figure. Uh, so here we have uh, the easing model again. So we have, but here we have one boundary arc which is blue and one boundary arc which is, is red. So this is uh, different from this case where we had monochromatic uh, blue boundary data. 
uh, as you can see that uh, there are two mark points on the boundary uh, where um, I would mark the interface between uh, the blue and red boundary data. Uh, and it is believed that in the scaling limit, uh, these two uh, special points, uh, they give rise uh, to, uh, to beta uh, log singularities where beta is given by uh, root three minus two over, uh, over root three. Uh, and in general, one can get um, other values of beta uh, by uh, considering either some either special boundary data or condition the map with some special uh, event and uh, and so on. Uh, okay, so um, in a, in uh, in a work with uh, Ang Yan and Sun, uh, we prove what we call a conformal welding result uh, for these uh, LPG disks. Uh, so to describe what we prove, uh, then we assume first that we, are, that we have some uh, LPG uh, disk uh, with two uh, singularities on the boundary, uh, where uh, the magnitude of the singularity is given by uh, beta minus plus beta plus minus two over gamma minus uh, gamma, uh, where beta plus minus are, uh, are two real uh, parameters. Uh, then we consider uh, an SLE kappa rho uh, on the unit disk, which is connecting uh, the two points plus minus i. Uh, and we assume that the row values are given by uh, these uh, these by these formulas in terms of uh, beta plus minus. Uh, so in other words, we have a gamma LQG disk uh, with two mark points, and uh, on top of this disk, uh, we draw an independent uh, SOE curve connecting uh, the two mark points. Uh, so when we um, uh, when we draw this SOE on on the disk. Uh, then the disk will be split into two smaller surfaces. Uh, we have uh, the green surface to the left uh, of, of the curve and the blue surface to the right of the curve. Um, and uh, the first thing uh, that we prove uh, is something which is maybe a bit surprising at first sight. So what we prove is that this green surface and this blue surface, they actually also have the law of uh, LQG disks uh, with, with two mark points. Um, so they will be uh, LQG disks uh, with um, uh, where uh, the singularities have a magnitude uh, beta minus and uh, beta plus uh, respectively. Um, so um, you can see that uh, on, on this blue disk, I have marked one boundary arc in purple. I've done the same thing uh, on the blue disk. Uh, and one can also argue that uh, the LQG length uh, of this purple curve is the same as the LQG length of, uh, of this purple curve. Uh, one can also argue that uh, conditioned on these two purple curves to have the same length, and then this uh, green disk uh, is independent of, uh, of the blue disk. Uh, so finally, uh, one can argue that if one is given only the green disk and the blue disk, uh, then one can recover the original disk uh, decorated by uh, an SLE uh, by gluing together uh, these two disks. Uh, and the gluing is happening according to, uh, to boundary lengths. Uh, so this result is, is not obvious because we require that uh, the gluing is done by uh, what we call uh, conformal welding. Uh, so roughly speaking, uh, this means that, um, uh, that we require that when you glue together uh, the two surfaces, then the resulting surface uh, has a unique uh, conformal uh, structure. Um, so, um, uh, so our proof is building on uh, earlier breakthroughs of, of Sheffield and of Plante, Miller and, and Sheffield. Uh, so Sheffield was uh, the first person uh, to prove uh, conformal welding results uh, of, of this type uh, in the setting of LQD surfaces. Uh, and he considered uh, the case of uh, infinite volume LQD surfaces, meaning uh, LQD surface, surfaces for which uh, the total uh, LQG area is, is infinite. Uh, and then uh, Duplan, Day, Miller and, and Sheffield, they uh, generalized the result of, of Sheffield. Uh, and uh, our work or our uh, theorem presented here, it can be viewed as a finite volume analog of, of these uh, results. Um, so uh, another remark is that we can um, we can also get um, a discrete analogs of uh, of this conformal uh, welding result in the setting of, of planar maps. Uh, so in the left part of the figure, uh, I have drawn a planar map uh, with an Ising model on its faces, which has uh, one uh, blue boundary arc and one uh, green boundary arc, uh, and the, the purple curve is showing the interface between um, uh, between the blue and uh, the green um, uh, green. Uh, green uh, faces. Uh, so if we cut the planar map along this purple curve, then we get uh, one planar map, uh, which has uh, blue boundary data and one planar map, which has green uh, boundary data. Um, and uh, and um, uh, we can recover uh, the disk with the curve on, on the left, in the left side of the figure by gluing together uh, these, two, these two maps. Uh, so this, uh, so this, um, uh, 
uh, this phenomenon on the setting of planar maps. It is an, uh, it is an exact uh, discrete analog uh, of uh, our conformal modeling result uh, in the case when uh, beta minus is equal to beta plus is equal to gamma uh, equals to uh, square root of, uh, of three. Uh, so, so far. Sorry, okay. to remind you, yeah. there's about uh, six minutes left. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, so, um, uh, so, so far we have considered uh, LQD surfaces with um, either zero mark points or two mark points. Uh, and we can also consider LQD surfaces with, uh, uh, with three mark points by uh, adding, uh, by sampling or having an additional parameter alpha. Uh, and then when we define the disk, we also add uh, an alpha log singularity to the field uh, at the point uh, one. Uh, so we prove a conformal loading result also for these disks uh, with uh, three mark points. Uh, so, um, uh, so then um, uh, in order to um, have a conformal loading result for the, for the, for the disk with uh, three mark points, then we need to rewrite the law of the SOE. Uh, so, in, so this uh, purple curve, uh, it is a curve uh, whose Radonuclein derivative with respect to an SOE kappa rho is given by uh, this, um, this power uh, of uh, the derivative of the conformal map psi evaluated at one, where uh, psi is the map which takes uh, this blue domain and which sends it to the unit disk and which fixes the location of plus one is i and, uh, and one. Uh, so otherwise, the exact same uh, results hold uh, as in the setting of, uh, of disks without uh, this third uh, map point. Uh, so going back to uh, the disk with uh, three marked uh, points. Um, so Rumi and Zou, they proved uh, an exact formula for such disks. Uh, so we can look at this uh, blue uh, boundary arc, I call it L. Uh, so they proved an exact formula for the LQG length uh, of this uh, boundary arc. So they proved that the length of the, L of the uh, of, um, uh, they proved that uh, the length of this uh, boundary arc, um, it has an exact power law, uh, and they also identified the constant uh, in front of this uh, power law. And you can see that this constant is given um, uh, is given by by this formula, which is also involving these uh, double gamma functions. Uh, and they used uh, used tools from uh, label conformal field theory. Uh, so this uh, so their their result can be viewed as um, as as a disk analog of this uh, DOCC formula that you may re recall from uh, Remy's talk. Uh, so here um, on this slide, I consider uh, boundary length for the disk with two mark points. Um, so this is, uh, in some sense, it's an easier problem than the one considered on, on this slide because we consider a disk with only two mark points instead of three mark points. So it's actually an easier uh, problem. Well, it's, it's, it's an easier object. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we're considering a harder problem because on this slide, we're interested in the joint law of uh, the left and right uh, boundary arcs. Uh, and um, and we show that uh, that uh, this, this joint law is given by uh, this formula if the singularity is uh, gamma uh, singularity, and it's given by this formula if the singularity uh, has magnitude two over gamma plus gamma uh, over two. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, so um, so and we're actually only able to. So the problem we're considering here is. E is, is on one hand more difficult than one on this slide because here we were only interested in the marginal law of, of one uh, boundary arc. Uh, and uh, we're only able to, to establish these formulas in, in, in the special cases when the singularity is equal to either gamma or two over gamma plus, uh, plus gamma over two. Uh, so the idea of, of the proof uh, of this result uh, is to uh, use particular encoding of uh, the legal quantum gravity disks in terms of uh, planar Brownian motion. So this is from a work of Duplantia, Miller and, and Sheffield. So these exact formulas that you see here uh, for the joint law of the lengths, it's coming from uh, exact uh, formulas uh, for uh, a planar correlated uh, Brownian motion. Uh, so from the results that we have seen uh, so far, um, then it's not so, so hard to, uh, to establish uh, our moment formula in, in a special case. Uh, so uh, if um, so one can establish the formula in a special case where uh, rho minus is equal to one of these special values, uh, which is corresponding to this green disk, uh, being one of these uh, two special disks uh, that we understand well. Uh, to be concrete, we assume that uh, it has uh, gamma uh, singularities. Uh, so um, if we now look at the length at this uh, red curve, then we can compute the length of this curve in, in two different ways. Uh, so we can compute it both by looking at the left-hand side of the welding identity and the right-hand side of, of the welding identity. Uh, and since I'm a bit, little bit short on uh, on time, uh, I will just mention that um, 
uh, that one can compute uh, the law of the length of this red curve, uh, both by using, by combining this formula and uh, this formula, one can compute the length of this red curve in, in two different ways, by looking at the left-hand side of the identity and the right-hand side of the identity. Uh, and then by, uh, by setting these two expressions equal to each other, then one gets uh, this, uh, this moment. One gets uh, yeah, the formula for the moment. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, um, uh, in order to get, uh, so this gives our moment theorem in this special case. In order to get uh, the general case of the moment theorem, then uh, roughly speaking, uh, the idea is to, to interact the welding result. So we glue, instead of gluing, gluing together three disc, the two disks, we're gluing together three disks. Uh, and then, which gives us a disk with two curves. Uh, then from this disk with two curves, we can um, consider uh, the corporal maps, Psi 1, Psi 2, and Psi, uh, as in the figure, and one can use a product rule for differentiation, uh, and uh, which allows us to, to relate um, the moments uh, associated with these three maps. Uh, and then by varying the parameters, uh, one is able to show that this, um, uh, that if we assume that, for example, uh, this moment is is the moment that we already know, uh, then by varying the parameters, one can one can use this also to, to also obtain uh, these two uh, these two other moments. Uh, okay, so thanks. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very nice and and picture picture heavy talk. Um, uh, we'll continue um, straight away with uh, the discussion by Yi Zeng, I suggest, and then. I think uh, since we are relatively good on time, I think there will be plenty of, of time for questions. So Yi Zeng, are you here? Yeah. Good. Then I would ask Nina to uh, unshare and uh, Yi Zeng uh, to share his screen. Okay, here we go. Yes, perfect. Uh, we can perfectly see it. So yeah, uh, this stage is yours, Yi Zeng, for the discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. Thanks uh, to Nina for the great talk. So um, that was quite some um, like yeah, it's quite astonishing uh, stuff you were representing. And um, and as you um, yeah, as you probably have noticed, this is like um, all this machinery is, is um, has been like uh, developed like quite a lot, and it's very sophisticated nowadays. And I just wanted to hi uh, highlight a little bit why. Um, why uh, like uh, these type of problems are like really so difficult to like at least some of these questions are really so difficult to approach. Um, okay, first of all, I mean um, the motivation uh, why, uh, why SLE was introduced. You have seen that today. So people wanted to describe uh, objects that are like uh, conformally invariant, like for instance the easing model, or like this is also a famous picture Bernoulli percolation. So um, yeah, so basically, um, as you have seen today, um, the realization was that like that um, that was what first appeared in the work uh, by Schramm, that uh, if you look at those uh, boundaries of those clusters, that actually you can um, you can set this up in a certain way that you can really write down things explicitly. So. Uh, what is really nice is like, okay, you have explicit formulas and then you can compute quite a bunch of um, uh, quite a bunch of quantities, like for instance, crossing probabilities like, like so having like a black path from lower boundary to upper boundary. Um, also you can compute house of dimensions of the curve and some things like that's uh, something that's uh, you can interpret as occupation density and so on. Um, what is a bit complicated here, though, is like, I mean, you have a, a formula, a ex very explicit formula that, um, I mean, uh, have a highlight right here, perfect. Okay. Uh, do, you do have an explicit formula that you've seen in Nina's talk here, um, but um, that formula uh, is like uh, applies for um, the conformal map. So this is a formula that gives you the map um, that uh, maps out the complement of the curve. So this, this, is, this is the map uh, where it gives you a formula. Uh, and if you really want to re, uh, uh, get uh, to, the uh, to a point uh, so on the curve, you would need to like take limits. So you would need to take the uh, pre-image of that point, basically, uh, uh, which is a boundary point. So you would need to 
um, yeah, to take the whole map at the boundary point. So for instance, you have to take limits here. Um, so the, uh, that's a bit uh, tricky sometimes because you do, uh, the direct formula does not apply to gamma, but it only applies to the conformal map. So you can say like a formulate it, and it was say, saying that you have a formula for points that are off the curve. Um, on the other hand, um, this is uh, actually all problems that you can observe that uh, from points that are off the curve are actually yeah, become easier to compute because like for instance if you want to compute the distance of a point to the curve you can just like run your formula here and then uh, by some analysis you can really compute explicitly the uh, like the probabilities that your curve come close to that point um on the other hand if you want to say something about the curve itself i mean one natural question would be like okay asking for its regularity um that's uh, yeah. You have to do like go a bit away around that, right? So you have this limit here. So um, so that's a so one way you can uh, you can uh, uh, access this gamma um, would be okay. Uh, approximating that limit here, and then you change uh, and then you take the increments in time, and then you you take back the limit again. Oh, actually, uh, there's <laughs> uh, it's it's hard to get. Uh, to, uh, like do something better than that but like but when you do that you see okay uh, also one can um you can do a very crude estimate just estimating that difference using the, the fundamental theorem of calculus upper bounding by this by the derivative um but this seems uh, this approach although it works pretty well uh, but it's still a bit crude so for instance uh, you don't really get the correct uh, regularity for SLE with parameter kappa equals eight. Um, and also for like other values of kappa, actually that has worked pretty well. Um, um, so you can, for instance, okay, let, me, let me, oops. No. Wanted. Okay. Uh, so for instance, uh, you can uh, write down uh, an optimal Herder exponent for the curve. So like the op optimal Herder uh, exponent has been computed in a paper by Frederick and uh, Greg Lawler. Um, but if you, um, if you want to say more about that, for instance, like for Brownian motion, you, you know exactly the modulus, right? And um, I mean, you would expect that for the critical, uh, so the critical herd exponent, it's not um, herd continuous, but it's not really easy to really prove that. Um, and on the other hand, I also uh, actually I prefer talking about uh, p variation instead of um, herd regularity because that's uh, p variation is parametrization independent. Um, and also the um, correct um, p variation exponent is known so actually actually i'm gonna write this down alpha i'm gonna write this down because it's long formula but p is not that a long formula so it's one plus kappa over eight uh, infimum two uh, at least when you're not eight and again for if you are equal to that uh, exponent um, you would expect that it's not uh, does not have the p variation regularity what actually does work is like uh, if you take um, if you take uh, instead of uh, power of p, x to the p, but if you add like a log correction, um, one over x, I think, yeah, um, and then uh, minus p minus epsilon, then uh, actually SLE does have that regularity. Um, actually, I've been. Uh, I wanted to like look into uh, proving some lower bounds for that, so that you like uh, uh, cannot uh, whether you how much you can really improve on that exponent here. But uh, yeah, I have <laughs> had have been so much things to do, so I didn't really uh, get uh, much farther than that. And also, like okay, um, just for the com for completeness, um, what works for the herder. Mod type modulus is yeah you, you can you can have like a bound like which is looks something like um, so you have the modulus which is um, x to the power of alpha um, and then you have a logarithm of one over x to the power of one plus epsilon so this does work um, but uh, we don't really know what the really the correct uh, exponent here should be like for Brownian motion we know this should be like a logarithm to the power of one half 
every number. And here you have a double logarithm. But I, anyway, yeah. Um, so uh, another thing, okay. Um, time is running fast. So another question that's a bit complicated is also like, uh, okay, if you put in some other driving functions, for instance, if you change the kappa, then all, everything changes drastically. And it's um, the dependence of, um, of the curve, for instance, like on your driving function. So when you, even when you vary kappa, it's not even clear that uh, you really have like a continuous uh, dependence for all kappa. So what does work against this kappa uh, less than eight over three, um, but um, yeah, but we don't have any results beyond that. Um, so, um, so and all this actually works pretty well when instead of Brownian motion, you put in a function that's more driving function that's more regular, like for instance, further uh, functions works. Um, uh, but like yeah, for Brownian driving functions, we do have some probabilistic arguments that sh show that all these things are true. But since everything, all this construction is actually deterministic, so you put in, you feed in a driving function and it, it get something out of that. So all this construction is really deterministic. So that's why um, uh, that would be like actually um, yeah. So it would be more satisfying if we really know what uh, what about uh, about Brownian motion uh, makes everything work here. Um, okay, just like a short comment that the formula that you have seen up there is really only nice when you are like on the half plane and going from zero to infinity. So for instance, if you change coordinates and let like your SLE run from zero to some other point, then you already get like, you still get a formula that's really good, um, but you see already here that, okay, you've seen that in Nina's talk, uh, that you uh, that you have an um, equation on your driving function that also depends on some V, and that V again depends on uh, your driving function. So it's really a system of SDEs that you get. And um, yeah, so uh, you can generalize that. You can add like more force points, basically. You, have, you also see in the formula in Nina's slides. Um, but yeah, so already here, the uh, a direct analysis is a bit difficult. So what you could also do is you could construct uh, these type of things by changing your measure. So you have your SLE and you change your measure, then you get like this. Uh, uh, get something, uh, you can get SLE kappa with force points. Um, okay, so in the last couple of minutes, I'm just gonna comment, okay, I'm gonna skip that. So um, so basically what I wanted to say is that like people have been like very creative and trying to prove things, for instance, the reversibility of SLE, if you want to go for, uh, take SLE from A to B, or whether you take uh, SLE from B to A. Um, so if you just do a direct analysis, really not that clear whether this gives you the same law, but it actually it does. And um, so, um, so like, so the first one to prove such a thing, Dapun Jan, who used like, uh, like a coupling argument that you like, okay, you can, tr uh, you try to construct a pair of uh, like, SLEs that like one growing from like A and another one growing from B. So you start with two independent ones and then you like ch change the measure. And then, uh, uh, and then you show that in some way you can uh, construct them in a way that in uh, the, the joint law of these two describe uh, the same SLE. Um, they have been like, okay, there have been more couplings uh, with uh, Gaussian free fields. So that's actually, uh, getting more mysterious because, like, you can construct uh, you can construct a, a pair um, of a Gaussian free field with an SLE, uh, where in some sense this the SLE is the so-called flow line. So, like, okay, if everything were smooth, you could make sense of that equation really as a flow line of your field, but. Um, so yeah, so since everything is very rough. Uh, uh, so, okay, the, the, the meaning is basically you describe the boundary values uh, of your Gaussian free field on the complement of your SLE, and then that's how you interpret this identity. But the thing is, like, it's really not clear what really happens here. So you can construct, you do some con probabilistic constructions so that, like, this, like, pair exists, but 
uh, yeah, you don't we don't really know an analytic description of that uh, identity. Um, and also, you don't really have an independent description of SLE. So you still have to start with SLE with the formula, like the Leuven equation that you've seen above. Um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, right. Um, right. Also, actually, actually, people have been proved a lot of things. I just take out an example because I find this uh, fits in the context. So I've I found this uh, statement in one of uh, this paper by, uh, by Nina with some others that they use uh, this coupling with the Gaussian free field to show Herder regularity of space filling SLE when it's parametrized with uh, alpha less, uh, yeah, how uh, parametrized by area. Um, but actually, I, I'm really not an expert on how the, all these arguments go because it seems very complicated and really don't know whether you can get anything quantitative out of that. Um, okay, I think Tom is trying to urge me into finishing. Okay, let me just make a last comment about the conformal welding um, uh, to, uh, method yeah, that Dean was mentioning. Yeah, I'm going to finish in a minute. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so yeah, so actually this was this uh, the problem of conformal welding uh, has been appeared in complex analysis quite some while ago. So the idea is like you have two Riemann surfaces and once you glue them together to another Riemann surface and want to identify the curve. And again, this is something that's well understood if you have more regular uh, like welding functions, you have gluing rules, but um, if you talk again talk, uh, in the setting of quantum surfaces, um, this is uh, getting more tricky. And again, we, we ha have like some probabilistic constructions that you can couple your SLE with like those surfaces in this where this is suggested that this is true. But again, we don't really have, we don't really know what happens there uh, analytically. And also actually uh, what I find curious is since, uh, actually I was very surprised to see that you can really compute things about SLE using this method. So um, as Nina said in the, uh, in the talk, you could in principle write everything down in terms of the Leuven equation, but things are like really impossible to analyze. So actually um, it might, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe you can, uh, see some consequences actually for the the, the processes that, that appear in the SLE process from these and know from this like way around this long way around but like yeah I don't really know um, <laughs> okay let me finish this now so yeah <laughs> thanks for attending yeah, so thanks, uh, Yu Zheng, for this uh, very nice discussion. And uh, as before, I'd uh, kindly ask everybody to turn on their videos to give both Nina and Yu Zheng a well-deserved round of applause for their very illustrative talks. So thanks very much to the two of you. And uh, I think we are already uh, in the chat, at least uh, in the midst of um, of of uh, some discussion. So maybe I'll just go step by step. There were two questions by Zen Yao Sun, which I believe have been answered. Maybe, uh, is that right? Or um, perhaps, uh, yeah. So I think uh, Nina has already answered them. Oleg had some questions, which I think uh, Nina has already answered as well. Um, and so we have two additional questions by Andre Sraka about uh, with this, I suppose uh, that refers to uh, Oleg's question, hold for any number of multiple S SLEs and high dimensional SLEs. Uh, perhaps, uh, Andre, you wanna ask the question yourself or? Thanks, basically it relates to the general presentation of the proofs and so on. With this hold also, there were some grounds for three, I think SLEs. With this holds also for any number, in terms of the multiple SNEs and how about generalizations to higher dimensional spaces. I think that we know that for SLE, this is in general more a planar um, construct. So could this also be generalized? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so, um, so at least in the case, I can take the second one first. So regarding high dimensional SLE, so at the moment there is not really any analog of SLE in higher dimensions. Um, so 
So it's not really clear uh, how one would somehow adapt the definition of SLE to, to higher dimensions. Um, since the space of conformal maps um, is, is much smaller for high dimensional spaces, so it's not really any obvious way to, to adapt the definition uh, to more than two dimensions. Um, as regarding um, if, if the results hold for any number of multiple SLEs, so it depends a little bit what one uh, means by multiple SLEs. So in the very last uh, slide of my talk, then I had a two S two had a disk with two SLE type curves coupled together, and for that type of multiple SLEs, one can actually do uh, do everything exactly the same uh, because let's say so we had like a disk with two curves. One can look at the rightmost curve, and the marginal law of the rightmost curve is actually an SLE kappa row. Uh, so then. Uh, the result is just immediately uh, immediately um, applying also to that that curve. Uh, one can also define something called multiple SLEs, where one considers, let's say, two curves, but where the starting points of the two curves and ending points of the two curves are different. And for that type of multiple SLE, then um, it's uh, then one would need to set things up differently in order to to address it. Uh, there is a chance that one could do something similar also for for that type of multiple SLE, but, but one needs one needs some uh, some new ideas. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks. thanks. Everything thanks. gets good. Thank. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for some further questions, if there are any. You can just uh, just go if you have some. Okay, that doesn't seem to be the case. I okay, so maybe then I will try to expand a bit my question to okay. Nina. So what I meant, so usually in the usual SLE, if I, as long as I understand correctly, you don't need to somehow pre-specify the law of your noise. You kind of get it for granted. You say, okay, all noises that satisfies certain properties are only Brownian motion. So my question was whether you can say, okay, I want this and this and this set of axioms. Yeah. And okay, and then all the noises are the ones that were given by your formula. Okay, ah, uh, that's okay. That's uh, that's a very good question. So actually, for uh, if you look at SLE kappa rho with only one force point, as if you have, then I think there is a very similar axiomatic uh, description, which is saying that it's somehow the unique. You, you can define conformal uh, invariance and domain marker property also invariance of these properties where you just keep track of one extra point, and then SLE kappa rho with with one force point is actually the unique. You can get the unique uh, characterization just as for SLE. Uh, I think in the case of more force points, I think uh, I think there is actually you can also write down a similar list of axioms with let's say two points. Uh, I think it's actually the case that then one can, one actually gets a bigger family uh, than than just the SLE kappa rho with two for with two points. So yeah, so uh, and I think there is uh, I think there is done some work on this made by Julian Dubida, where he has written some, uh, where he has given some sort of more, uh, like a characterization of exactly which measures that one can get um, uh, get from, from such axioms. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any further question? I think we have uh, time for one uh, question. Okay, let me check uh, the chat. Okay, okay and maybe Nina, you, you know a bit of what I uh, asked uh, uh, in the last question I put there. So uh, do you know, like, if you can have any, do you have any consequences that if you already know that those complicated quantities have like some exact solutions that you also understand a bit better about how those process, SLE processes behave? Uh, so I actually don't see any very immediate consequences. So I, I did I did say something about that you can also express this moment formula as in terms of a solution of a particular PDE. Uh, so what one gets it is this PDE at evaluated at like a particular point. Uh, but I am not sure if one can say anything anything more uh, sort of about like the solution of the PDE in general, for example. Okay. Um, so I don't see. Uh, yeah, so, I, I, um, so it's it's a very good and interesting question, but I actually at this point I don't quite see any 
any consequences on the SME side or on the like more on the Lovna chain side besides like uh, the solution of the PDE evaluated that at one particular point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just thinking maybe like if you know the solution of some PDE, for instance, like uh, then you can maybe kind of transform that and solve other PDEs from that or something like that. I don't know. But like, yeah, thanks for the answer. Uh, yeah, I yeah, know it's, it's something one could look into, I, which I haven't thought about a lot myself. Um, but yeah, my, my first thought is just that I didn't I didn't quite see, uh, see any consequences. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something that yeah, could be looked more into. <laughs> 